Number one, be careful. I'm not going to borrow money on interest anymore. No, sir. Not a loan for college fees, not to buy a house, not to buy a car, and not to take my wife on a trip to Disneyland. And also the people borrowing money in interest to perform the Hajj, you know that. <laughs> and the United States they do even better than that. In that glorious country from called the United States, from which people come, scholars come to teach us the Deen. They buy a building with a bank loan on interest. They designated a masjid. Yeah? And people start performing salat in the masjid and they hold something called a fundraising dinner <laughs> and they say, brothers, 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 the house of Allah is his river. Come on, come on. <laughs> so we're not going to do that. <laughs> but when they don't get you, to the front door. They try to get you to the back door. So they create a curious thing called the Islamic Bank. And the Islamic Bank says, well, some of the transactions of the Islamic Bank are of course halal, but this is the window dressing, so to say the dust in your eyes, because the major source of funding for the Islamic Bank is what is deceptive. <coughs> if I engage in a transaction with you in which both the buyer and the seller are aware of the profit margin, the cost price and the selling price, the difference between the two, and both in agreement on this transaction, it's called murabaha. It's a valid transaction, it's a halal transaction, okay? So what the bank says is that you want to buy this house and the cost of the house is 500,000 South African rands and you don't have the 500,000 South African rands, so no problem. We will buy the house, which is the first lie. We will buy the house for 500,000 and we will sell it to you for 1 million. Hmm? And since both buyer and seller are aware of the profit margin and both buyer and seller are in agreement on the profit margin, it qualifies as Morabaha. So come on, here's a check for 500,000, go buy the house. The first problem with this is that the bank cannot sell what it does not own. That's the first problem. So you must first buy the house and establish your legal ownership. You cannot sell an option. Not in Islam. So after you bought the house and established legal ownership, which involves a lot of fees, eh? only then you can sell. But the bank does not do that, obviously. So that's the first problem with the transaction. But there's a second problem with the transaction. And that is that the Prophet would buy goods and would not have the cash to pay for it. And the shopkeeper would allow him to take the goods and he'd pay later. So this is called a credit transaction where you pay later. But there is absolutely no evidence, not a shred of evidence that the shopkeeper was allowed to increase over the cash price for the credit transaction. But the bank has increased the cash price to the credit transaction for the credit transaction. The cash price was 500,000 and the credit price is 1 million. The difference between the two, 500,000 rands, 
must be explained. Money has increased over time. There is no other reason to justify the increase in price but time. That money should increase over time, that is riba. That is how Makkah practiced riba. Makkah was a commercial city. And you'd have one marketing agency for the city, okay? It's called Caravan. Rikhlata shita'i was So the caravan would lead, would take goods from several people. Hmm? In order for you to put your goods into that caravan that Abu Sufyan is taking to Damascus, you need some you need some cash, you need some capital. So the money lender would lend money on the condition that you would repay him with an additional amount. That was riba in Makkah. So the money lender realizes an increase of, of his money over a period of time. That was riba, riba and nasiya. This is what the bank is doing. So when you go to the bank, ask the banker, what's the cash price? And if he hears you were a student of Imran Hussein, he refused to answer him. <laughs> he, he, he refused to answer him. But well, we don't deal in cash. You can then say to him, excuse me, sir, I don't want to be disrespectful. No. But um, a norm of a business transaction in Islam is always a cash transaction, sir. And a credit transaction is the exception to the norm. So if you're not offering you, offering people cash transactions, only credit transactions, sir. You should be ashamed of yourself. Salaam alaikum. <laughs> you must have a cash price if you want to have a valid transaction. And only after you establish a cash price, only then you can offer a transaction credit. But when you offer it as a credit transaction, you cannot have a higher price for credit over cash. If he offers you a credit transaction at a price higher than the cash price, Atu Burhanakum. Give me your dalil, give me your proof. And he says, Mufti so and so and Mufti so and so and Mufti so and so. Say, no, no, no. I want Muhammad to Islam. So if they don't get you through their front door, they get you through the back door. This is back door riba. What do we do now? You do what Fahri had done. Get out of it. If you have any bank loans on interest, if you have any credit, I'm not going to ask you. If you have any credit cards and so on, get out of it. If you have any student loans with interest, get out of it. Turn to Allah and make Tawbah, seek forgiveness. Ask Him kindly with tears in your heart, open a way for me, I want to get out of it. If you take money from me, Pakistan has borrowed money. And you now find yourself being strangled and it is sinful, you want to make Tawbah, what do you do? Can he can Pakistan unilaterally repudiate its external loans? No. Because Allah says in the Quran, wa in tubtum falakum ru'usu amwalikum. If you turn away from riba, then you are entitled to the return of the capital sum. Hmm? 
So if Pakistan borrowed money, Pakistan can say we are not going to pay the riba. Do what you want. We are unilaterally, unilaterally repudiating any obligation to pay the interest. You can do that. But you have to repay the capital sum which is borrowed. You can, of course, say we will repay the capital sum according to our capacity to repay, which is what Alan Garcia did in Peru. Yeah, about 20 years ago. He announced that we will repay our external debts based upon our capacity to repay. But you have to repay your capital sum. If you don't have the means, at all, then there is something in Islam called bankruptcy. But if you want to claim bankruptcy, then look at what the Prophet did. A man came to the Prophet and said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, my creditors are after me, they are after me. I can't repay them. Please help me, tell them, to do something about it. He called the creditors. He took hold of the man's property, all the property, and sold it. Left him with only the clothes on his back. And then distributed the sales amongst the creditors. And then wrote off the balance. So the man is now free. Religion cannot allow someone to remain indebted indefinitely. That's there in the Torah. It is there in the Torah that no debt can continue for a period longer than seven years. Seven years. After seven years it has to be written off. Hmm? So you can apply for bankruptcy. But they know about it, so they're making the bankruptcy laws more and more difficult for you because they don't want you to escape from slavery. Hmm? Then the other option is to get out of their countries, get to a place where you can escape from their stranglehold. The other thing to do is once you are out of it to return to the Sundamai, gold and silver. If you can do it in the city, fine. I don't think you can succeed. They will seize all your money. So I say return to the countryside and build micro markets. And in the micro markets you will have gold and silver as money. And if you have a shortage then you lose articles of food consumption which are in abundant supply and have a shelf life. Good. One last thing. In Islam there is something called musharaka, partnership. If you want to buy a house, long time, long ago we would build a foundation first and then put up one room. And if you did not have money to put up windows and doors, you'd, they had rice bags made out of jute and you'd hang a rice bag for the window. And I saw it with my own eyes. And then you'd build a second room and a third room and so. And that's how you built a house. Nobody went and borrowed money to build a brand new house. Boy, you should see it. The tiles in the bathroom. <laughs> and you should see that custom built kitchen. That's what the wife wanted. 